Um, I'm delighted to um, um, introduce Larry Franznick, and who will be being introduced and chaired by Sarah L. Jackson, and I'd like to hand the stage over to them. So. All right. Hello. Welcome to our final keynote, How Pentiment Writes and Rewrites History. I'm really thrilled to be introducing Zoe. Um, I know at least several of us are in the midst of a first or second or third Pentiment playthrough ourselves. Um, and in our breakout sessions already, Pentiment has kept coming up as a really mechanically uh, and narratively interesting way of approaching and integrating into the game itself this issue of incompletion right, so and to... historical bias. So um... I think I'm not the only one excited to hear Zoe talk. Uh, but first, I should tell you who she is. Zoe Franznick is a narrative designer, a medievalist, and a geek. She has worked as a narrative designer on Obsidian Entertainment's Pentiment and is currently working on Avowed. She also hosts The Maniculum, a podcast which adapts medieval texts into tabletop RPG adventures. She received an MA in medieval studies from Trinity College Dublin, specializing in the development of magic and folklore. And she's always looking for new ways to explore old stories and would love to see a picture of your cat. Hint. You can find her other work at meanderingmedievalist.com. And with that, over to you, Zoe. All right. First off, can everybody see and hear me? I'm hoping so. Okay. I'm getting thumbs ups. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Yay. There's a Q&A at the end. I've saved room for that because I love having questions and dialogue. So please don't let me talk through this entire thing. Uh, and also, sort of obviously, there are going to be spoilers for Pentiment. I've tried not to give any major spoilers, but there are like Act 2, um, Act 3 oops, details uh, that are going to pop up. So fair warning there. Uh, and first off, thank you to James so much for organizing this and Tess for inviting me in the first place and to Adam from Pluto History for connecting me with all of these uh, wonderful people. Uh, and also major thanks to Shyla and the Obsidian comms team for helping me put this together. They made my job doing this so much easier because uh, despite working in games, I am not a techie person and I am just so excited to be here and present this weird and wonderful game to you all and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at how we created Pentiment. Uh, I've also been asked to speak a little bit about my background since I'm in the unique and strange position of having worked in academia as well as in professional game development now. So I'll elucidate a little bit about how I got there and where the two fields, in my opinion, can work better together. So. All right, uh, a little bit about me, as Sarah has already said, I'm currently a narrative designer at Obsidian Entertainment. I've worked on Pentiment primarily uh, as one of the three narrative designers there, and I'm currently working on Avowed. I've got a BA in English from Purdue and an MPhil in Medieval Studies from Trinity. And again, I've sort of played and specialized in this uh, medieval magic framework and narrative theory. I'm also the co-host of the Mediculum podcast and with Mac, who is also here. Uh, hi, Mac. And we basically read through weird medieval texts and adapt them to TTRPGs as a way to connect the two fields. So please feel free to ask us about that. Also, we would love to host any of you on the podcast. So anything you want to rant about, we would love to have you, so please don't be afraid to get in contact with us and do that because we love we love hosting um, all sorts of individuals, and this seems like a great crowd to do that with. So, anyway, how did I actually get from academia to game development? I never initially set out to be in game dev, but like many of my friends and colleagues in academia and in gaming, I have always been writing. Stories have been my obsession since I was a kid, and I was determined to learn from the best and create my own. And little did I know the crazy path that this would uh, send me down. 
I had super high ideals of academia and professorships as a child and had a very wonderfully strange classical education. So I grew up with old Greek myths. I started learning Latin in the third grade, uh, reading Aristotle, Cicero, Augustine in high school. And these ancient stories captured my imagination. So by the time I got into university and started digging into more medieval literature, I was absolutely hooked. And through my studies, I became absolutely convinced that these ancient stories being told again and again through manuscripts and then translated and sometimes botched by 19th and 20th century uh, translators uh, held the key to compelling storytelling, to me at least. And why else would we continue to retell them over and over, even to this day? And so it was based on this idea, along with a fascination of medieval perceptions of magic, especially when used in narrative, that led me to pursue my degree at Trinity. I loved everything I was doing at Trinity, but I really wanted to apply these medieval principles and patterns of storytelling to narratives that I myself was creating. And so when COVID derailed my plans of pursuing another degree, going on to a PhD, I decided to take the plunge and get out of academia. And so I couldn't leave the matter, like all of this in my head in theory alone, so I turned to video games. Why video games, of all things, you may ask? Well, a few reasons, the first of which uh, was that my chances of becoming a best-selling author overnight are probably slim to none, and I gotta have something to eat. But more realistically, I find that video games are one of the most interesting, cutting-edge ways that we are telling stories these days. Games allow for player agency and direction in ways that books and film do not. They also provide a framework and a level of narrative excellence that a lot of TTRPGs and game masters just can't facilitate. They also have, of course, a much larger audience. And to me, video games hit a perfect middle ground between passive and active storytelling. And that, that allows uh, writers and creators to experiment with player expectations and agency in a way that we really haven't seen before. And to me, video games is a lot like oral storytelling in a way that we haven't seen uh, in a very, very long time. And I, I like that tradition. And of course, many people thought that I was absolutely crazy. Academics don't tend to see the gaming world as high art and game devs don't really see a lot of applicability in medieval studies and things like that. Uh, and I had no experience in the industry. I was throwing away everything that I'd done in academia, but I saw it differently. And I'm very grateful that the folks at Obsidian, especially Pentiment's director, Josh Sawyer, who has a rich history um, in medieval studies and early modern studies. I, I'm glad that they saw it differently. Josh brought me on to write for Pentiment about halfway through the game's development, and it's been the ultimate dream project for me. And seeing so many folks, especially fellow medievalists, enjoy the game has been just an absolute joy to me. And I think that game publishers are beginning to see the value in carefully crafted narratives and allowing games like Pentiment to be made are really, really strengthening this case. So... Uh, why academia strengthens games and vice versa. I believe, and this is very brief, uh, I believe that when medievalists and academics uh, as a whole and game devs work together, we can really be benefit each other and strengthen each other's fields. Devs can make better games, deconstruct harmful tropes and narratives about history that are still being told and are pervasive in media, and educate and empower individuals in their day-to-day -day lives. Stories influence people and shape how they see the world and themselves. And we would be remiss to neglect the larger impact and audience that games have on the world. Likewise, by working with game devs on projects, academics can open up research and interest in their field that might not otherwise you know, be gathered or garnered and uh, educate otherwise uninterested audiences and create case studies of why research in the humanities should continue to be supported, which can sometimes be quite the fight. 
And I believe that Pentiment is a fantastic, if rather pointed, case study of this idea. And I've seen this again and again on my work uh, on the Monday Galen podcast and also in the receptions of Pentiment that people are routinely surprised at how much more interesting the medieval world is once they get past these like pseudo historical ideas of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages. And so really it's just about getting that material out there. So what is Pentiment anyway, if you are unacquainted uh, with it? So about the name itself, Pentiment comes from the Italian Pentimento or an image or sketch that lies underneath a finished painting that sometimes can peek through. Uh, we can see this in the sketches of the Mona Lisa that have been discovered that are underneath the finished painting itself. So that is a Pentimento. Uh, but Pentiment itself is a narrative adventure game set in 16th century Bavaria, where you play as uh, this guy, Andreas Mahler, a journeyman painter living in the small Alpine town of Tassing. After a visiting baron is killed, Andreas's mentor, one of the monks in Kiersaw Abbey, is blamed for the crime. Andreas must decide who really killed the baron, finish his masterpiece, uh, but every decision that he makes has a lasting consequence and draws him closer to the center of an underlying conspiracy in town. The game also takes place over 25 years as Andreas becomes a master artist, giving the player time to form personal relationships with every person in town and in the monastery. Whether these are good friendships or bitter rivalries is basically up to the player. And as you can see, the game's visual style is heavily inspired by illuminated manuscripts and early modern woodcuts. And our gameplay really allows the player to experience much of the art of the era, as well as the tasks and basically everyday life that these medieval individuals uh, would have you know, lived in and gone about. So, to the question itself, how do we construct and depict a medieval world? Everything that we portray will be biased, uh, just like our records of history itself, and any medieval world that we portray through this game will influence how our players perceive the past. So the biggest question, the biggest challenge in making Pentiment was how can we be faithful to our source material, sensitive to modern viewpoints of universal issues such as religion and sexuality, uh, and make the medieval world accessible and immersive, all while representing history in that accurate manner. We tackled this problem uh, in kind of an unorthodox way by posing it as the central conceit of the story and inviting the player as Andreas Mahler, the artist, to engage in literally depicting history for themselves through paintings, through art, through writing that history down. How do you, the player, choose to paint the history that you've experienced over these 25 years? What story do you want to tell? And so through careful research, timeless storytelling techniques, and player choice, Pentiment does its best to depict a compelling medieval world, which, if not 100% accurate, provides a realistic and plausible representation of the early modern period while challenging players' assumptions about what history in this time looked like. So, our sources. Uh, in order to depict this world as accurately and, ac and accessibly as possible, the entire team, not just me, not just Josh, did boatloads of research into this period. We've also looked into other depictions of the medieval world uh, and medieval media for inspiration. So we are very, very clearly inspired by and have Easter eggs, in fact, to several of these works, including uh, the Cavfell mystery series, The Name of the Rose, very, very obviously, uh, The Return of Maton Guerre, Andre Rublev, The Cheese and the Worms, plenty of those texts we used as references and inspiration. 
We also scoured databases and articles. Many of you are already familiar with these databases and use them every single day uh, for our research. So we've got Hildegard's Physica, which Sister Gertrude shown here. We love Sister Gertrude. She adores the Physica. Uh, we also used manuscripts and references to early modern Yiddish printing, which just barely fits in our time period. We've got references and pages of medieval texts sprinkled throughout the game for the discerning eye to find. So we really tried to um, provide all of this textual background both in the game itself uh, and in sort of the game feel as you played through. And because accuracy was so important to us, we also included a bibliography in our credits because we want our audience to understood that we took this representation seriously. And like any good academic, we cited our sources. We have our sources to back it up. So having all of this research is one thing, but we had to make game decisions of how we represent that in the game itself. How, how do we represent this medieval world? And so to do this, we very, very deliberately set our little fictional town of Tassing in Bavaria along some of the major trade routes of the day. Thus, Tassing itself acts as a microcosm for medieval and early modern Europe at this time. Uh, and it allows us a little bit of leeway to play with who and what we represent, such as Baltus, who is our little Leonardo-like inventor, or Werner, a small town university educated doctor. Would such men really live in a town like Tassing? It's plausible, if not probable. So we had a little room to play and a little creative freedom to play with representation there. Much of these choices are represented visually as well as through the game's narrative. So you can see that in our game style, we really wanted to represent the beautiful art of the period. Notably, we represent older characters like Brother Piero here in uh, the illuminated manuscript style with their paint sort of chipping away over the course of, of the game. Uh, but our younger characters like Father Guernot are done in a more woodcut block print style. We also have Brother Sebhat here, who is on a visit from the Ethiopian Church in Ethiopian Church in Rome, and he's depicted in the very traditional illuminated manuscript Ethiopian style. We also wanted to depict the sheer depth of history in Tassing through context. So as the player goes through town, goes through um, up to the abbey that you can see up here in the background, uh, you can see and interact with uh, ancient Roman ruins, pagan things. We've got little saints shrines up here, and we even have sort of references to the technology that is uh, coming of age, if you will, at this time. So you've got this windmill, the only one in Bavaria, uh, again, our creative license here a little bit uh, up in this back corner. So everything we depict here throughout the game sets the stage that the world has layers upon layers of history, both seen and unseen. And it is up to you as Andreas to uncover these secret histories. So that's a little bit about how we used our sources. So how do we make this all accessible? Since our game is set in the very rapidly changing world of the Reformation, there is a lot of information to get into the players' heads, especially if they are uh, not familiar with this period. Again, a lot of this information we reflect visually, as you just saw, but some of it has to be more explicit. Uh, plot crucial topics like the Reformation and the Peasants' Revolt need contextualizing and explaining. We do this in a few ways, most importantly, through dialogue. Andreas's role as an outsider in Tassing makes this much, much easier. Because he is a visitor in Tassing and an artist, uh, he is able to sort of butt into conversations and ask about troubles and things that are unfamiliar to him in Tassing. He is not a peasant. He is not a brother in the monastery. So in this way, the player can learn about these topics in real time in a way that matters to them as they snoop around the town and attend the spinning bee or dance at the St. John's Eve festival. They can pick up on these topics without a massive info dump or a lecture. 
Players can also see and hear what different people think about these events and issues. Some monks are more sympathetic to the peasants' plight, others are not. Likewise, some folk lean into the pagan traditions in town, while others shun them. Some of these events also double as mini-games, which are meant to be interactive ways that players can explore the day-to-day -day lives of these medieval folk, such as, you know, uh, spinning wool and things like that. We also incorporated an interactive glossary that I just absolutely adore uh, that players can access at any time through their journal or by clicking on an underlined word such as Imperial Beat, Wanderhiara, or St. John's Eve. They can immediately pull out of the game itself into the marginalia and read a definition of the word. And again, this ex in this accessibility, we reaffirm that the player is living out a recorded history, literally in a book, uh, a history that they themselves are rewriting and writing as they play, and not everything maybe as it seems. So here you can see we've got our little marginalia oyster. Uh, the player clicks on St. John's. We've got a very long manicule pointing up to that, or for characters that you may not remember who they are, you can click on their name and see a little picture of them. And this is one of my favorite things about Pentiment that we did. So how did we remain uh, sensitive to modern viewpoints uh, as well as like actually reflect what's going on in this time period? There's, there's a lot of subtlety there that needs to come across. One of our key aims in Pentiment was to create a universally compelling story. After all, the same issues that affect people now affected people in the Middle Ages, from workers' rights, uh, property disputes, marriage problems, infidelity, depression, abortions and miscarriages, loss of children and parents, even just gossip all affect us now and people in this period. So by creating scenarios that feel familiar to the players and immersing them in tasking for so long, again, that 25 year period, we were able to further contextualize medieval issues such as the peasants revolt or church law in terms that feel real important and pressing to the player. However, we really didn't want to stop there. As we know, the largest collections of texts that we have in the Middle Ages were written by usually straight white men, oftentimes monks who had little real knowledge of the world outside of their monasteries. We reflect this in Pierre Sau's monastery and scriptorium itself, uh, but we did not want to neglect the other vibrant lives of those who didn't have as much of a voice in this period, such as women, Romani, Jews, uh, and just because we are depicting the Middle Ages does not mean that we have to replicate their minimization and prejudices in our depiction of the Middle Ages. So instead, we chose to deliberately include rather than exclude vignettes of these individuals' lives in both happy moments and the consequences that these individuals faced should they step out of line of the status quo. And as Andreas, a straight white male who does have power and influence in this medieval society, the player may be able to affect these outcomes for good or ill based on the choices that they get to make. So for instance, what will the player choose when a nun comes on to him or he sees two brothers passionately engaged while sneaking through the library at night? How does he react when an old woman denounces God for the old pagan ways that she was brought up with? How does he treat the visiting tinker's heresy? Andreas's options for characterization allow space for players to consider the prejudice and alienating world of these individuals. We've made a great effort throughout the game to represent the Middle Ages, but we're even more careful to ensure that we do not affirm the time periods, misogyny, racism, and other severe flaws as devs and in the narrative itself, and as the player plays as Andreas. When any character tells stories, whether personal or regarding the town's history, Andreas may also wonder why he's never heard or read about any of these new facts. Again, reminding players that written or popular histories may not tell the entire story. So here you can see a few of these individuals. We've got Vasklav, uh, we've got the old widow Atelia, we've also got Benjamin. Uh, we've got Matthew and Rudiger. These are the two monks who uh, are passionately engaged, if you will, in the library. We also have Illuminata, who is talking to Andreas about Dido um, and her history there. 
and she's explaining that, hey, you know, she didn't have a choice in becoming a nun. And uh, poor Andreas, I don't know if you can read that here, but his little thought bubble here says, oh, is it really that bad to be a woman? Is it really that limiting? So we get to, we get to push the boundaries there um, with basically what Andreas thinks and, and give him room to consider new opinions. So player choice and player consequence. This was very important to us as we go through. So as we invite the player to explore casting as Andreas Mahler, we also ask them to write history as they go. And because Pentiment lasts a span of 25 years in one village, the player can really see the consequences of their actions. Telling a toddler a story in her youth can change the course of her life, for example, or taking the time to help a couple with their marriage may result in positive consequences in that final act. Breaking the Abbey's rules may get you in trouble, but reveal hidden secrets that have greater effects later down the line, especially regarding the town's history. Our aim in Pentiment was to reflect the twofold nature of history. Every choice you make matters, but as an artist and a pseudo historian, Andreas Muller, you can also tilt how your actions are remembered in that retelling. So the final act in the game asks the player to choose how to depict the history of Tassing in a big town mural. There are a number of ways to paint the town's history, including ways that Andreas himself has affected Tassing over the past 25 years. As devs, we do not provide any clear answers as to who really killed the Baron or if your investigation was correct. We only provide consequences. There is no winning or losing pentiment. Just as in history, there are multiple sides to every story and consequences to follow. The crux of this game asks the player to meditate on their past actions and choose their own best way to represent history. Again, we do not offer whether these depictions are right or wrong, just different versions of history and what the player considers to be the truth. Ultimately, we hope that Pentiment represents the Middle Ages and early modern uh, in the early modern period in an incredibly accurate sense of spirit and reminds players, uh, casual gamers and serious academics alike, that history is just a series of stories that we tell. And there is a great deal more going on beneath that always deserves some digging into. I am more than happy to take questions. Thank you all so much for allowing me to present you with this detail uh, about Pentiment. And again, uh, if you want to uh, work with me, work with Mac and I on the Maniculum, we would absolutely love it. Uh, my contact info is on the slide. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any and all questions, comments, etc. that you may have. Thank you so much. And if you do have questions, please feel free to walk up to one of the little podiums that I'm sure we're all quite familiar with. 